Sunday, everybody. Happy Sunday, everybody. Let's stand together. Hello online, it's so good to have you with us. Join us in worship today. We celebrate the cross, we celebrate Christ, we celebrate the life that we have.
good morning. Okay, so, um, welcome. <laughs> okay, so today we're gonna try something. So just um, turn around and say hi to your, somebody sitting next to you. And if you don't know somebody, just smile and say hi. <laughs> be seated. <laughs> okay, welcome. And for everybody watching online, good morning and welcome. Okay, so my name is Dorsey Ann and I'll be reading the announcements for today. Okay, so the All Church Pancake breakfast is today following the service. Um, so you can join us in the uh, cafe fellowship area. Um, the men of Vant, the hot wheels in high ground. Um, that would be on Saturday, April 2nd from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. Um, if you have any questions, Jeff and Ian, is Jeff Reynolds here? Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, so, you, so he would be the one that you would go for. Um, and for the Encore group, they will be meeting for breakfast and fellowship on Tuesdays at 8 a.m. at the Golden Steel Cafe. Kathy LeBay, is she here? Okay, there she is. <laughs> okay, and given options. So you can give, um, there's online options on the website. Um, you can also text 84321 and enter your amount and search for the church, Can't Heal Church. Uh, and in person, we have mail as well, too. And you can also give for the kids camp and the Ukraine Christ support. Thank you. Thank you, Dorcia. You got another cool one. Look at that. Let's stand together again. The song says, Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured. Thank you for your love, God. Thank you for your grace and your shed blood. Let's sing together. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder
your grace, God. It follows us daily. We have only but to reach out and to take it. Thank you for your heart and your mind that is constantly on us, God.
better than you, Lord, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Good morning, church. Can you, can you hear me? <laughs> okay. Um, I'm so grateful to be here. And I know you all are because it's a wonderful day to praise the Lord. It's a wonderful day to be here. There's so many who do not have the chance to be here today. And I think that that makes me more humbled that God chose to have me here today. I'm going to say a word of prayer and we can continue with the service. Uh, let's close our eyes. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you because there is nothing that is better than you. There is nothing that needs more glory than you. There is nothing that needs more praise. Nothing that needs more gratefulness than you, God. Nothing that needs more of our faithfulness. Nothing needs more of our availability. Nothing needs more of our love, more of our praise, God, than you, God. And I thank you. I thank you because... Even when we don't do those things, God, even when we're not grateful, even when we're not as faithful, even when we don't have as much gratitude, God, that, that doesn't stop your love. It doesn't stop your faithfulness. It doesn't stop your consistency. It doesn't stop you from laying down your son for us, God. So, God, I thank you because we know it's not for us, but it's for you. We know it's not because we are chosen or because we are the people that could do better, God, but it's because that your love, it doesn't end. It has, it's unconditional, God. And today as we stand here, today as we prepare our hearts and our minds and our souls, God, to hear from you, we are honored. We are humbled because we know that everything you have to say to us, God, that it's going to bear fruit. It's the seed that is going to be buried deep into us, God. And even when we don't see it, God, even when we don't feel it, God, it's going to grow in us, God. And that you're going to increase within us and that when we decrease, God, we'll look more like you, Jesus. And we thank you that in this moment that you're here with us, that you're moving in this place, God, that you're moving in every spirit, in every mind, that you're healing every heart that in this in this place God for those who are going through anything God those who are going through a hard time God those who are having everything God that we, we lay it down on your feet that we lay it down there God because it's not for us to carry God it's not for us to fight it's not for us to try to figure it out but it's for you it's for us to bring it to your feet and to see what you do best God that you, when you show up that there is nothing that is impossible that there is nothing that can't move no mountain will stand in the way no highway cannot be formed overseas God so we welcome you in this place as we lay down everything God and for our nation and for those nations that are going through a hard time right now God I know that they're your children too I know that when they kneel and they cry and they call out but Father that you will show up that there is no place you will not go God and we send you there we send you to our brothers and sisters who are having a hard time getting out of these places God we thank you because you're there and that even if we don't feel like we can do enough that you're doing everything God that you're showing up God we thank you that for our families who are not here for our for our friends and people we love God that you're protecting them that you're being with them and as we leave this place we ask you to cover us God cover our friends our family protect them and that nothing formed against us will prosper and in the mighty name of Jesus I pray thanking you because I know you've already done it amen Good morning, church. How's everybody doing? 
Oh, that was a little slow. How is everybody doing? <laughs> My name is Emma. For those who do not know me, uh, I am so excited, super excited to be here today and just share God news, right? I think uh, my story is God's story, and we each have our own story. And I'm so, I'm so happy that I am able to come here and stand here and share um, what God has done into my life, right? Um, I'm not going to lie. I was a little nervous, but you know what? I got this. <laughs> Um, my family, um, origin we came here in 2013. I come from a family of five, four sons. I mean, four brothers. <laughs> and I'm the only girl. So there's two older brothers and then me. And then the last two are twins. Um, fun fact, all my family are tall. I don't know what happened to me, you know. But uh, it's all good. I think there's a lot of benefit for being short, too, you know. Um <laughs> Unless when you have to get something, you know, that's too high from you. And then after having a fight with your brother, you're like, oh, can you give me this? <laughs> you know. Um, but I've been going to this church um, since 2013. So I don't know how long that been. You can do the math, maybe nine years. I'm not sure. But anyways. <laughs> um, but I'm here to talk about, if you can have this question in your head as I go, it's... Um, the sermon, I titled it, What Does It Mean to Accept Jesus as Your Personal Savior? You know, if you can think about this question as I go on on what I have to share today. But before that, I want to talk about um, what made me accept Jesus as my personal Savior. You know, we're doing baptized today, so um, it would just be right if I talk about that personal relationship that you choose to have with God, right? Um, I remember when I accepted Jesus as a personal savior, I was only eight years old. Uh, but there's a story that led to why I chose to accept him as my personal savior. Um, it was in December 25th during Christmas time. You know, it's a time that we're all supposed to be happy, uh, excited, because uh, it is Christmas. Um, it was on December 25th in the afternoon. I was playing outside like a normal kids will do. I was waiting for my mom to come back and take my brothers and I for Christmas dinner. You know, back home, uh, we, we, always, we always make homemade food, you know. But during Christmas, like holidays, it's a good time to go outside and buy some, um, like, fast food, you know. Because fast food is expensive there. I don't know why. Because you can get a burger here for $1 or $2, you know. But it's, it's really expensive to eat fast food there. So during Christmas, I want to eat some fast food, you know. Um, so I was just waiting for my mom to come back so she can take my brothers and I um, to go get some food. I had my hair done, and while I was playing outside, um, an incident happened. So my neighbors, um, they were building a house. There was a fence that, um, I mean, you're not really supposed to play in that fence, but little Emma was just, she just wanted to play in that fence. So I was playing in the fence, and it wasn't, the fence was not um, done yet, so I was, like, jumping on it. And so, like, the last time I jumped on it, I just, like, hurt myself really, really bad. Uh, I don't even, um, I can't, I, sometimes I still think about the pain. I cut myself really bad in between my legs. And I remember all you can see was blood on the floor. Um, I remember our babysitter, who was actually a family to us, she came quick and grabbed me with a panic on her face. She didn't know what to do. Um, all she did was she carried me and then trying to find taxis so they can. My mom had a store that was probably 25 minutes away from our house. Um, but my nanny, she kept stopping taxi, but because I was bleeding so much that many taxis, they didn't want to let me go in the car because I'm going to mess up the car or because... A lot of them, the taxis are not owned by them, so they just didn't want to lose their job, you know. Um, but I remember that did not stop her. She carried me from my house to my mom's store 25 minutes, and can you imagine how much blood I was just, I was just bleeding everywhere, you know. And the second my mom, as soon as we got to the store, 
Um, I can see the panic on my mom's my face. And I remember one of her friends, I still remember her, she took a taxi and she offered that taxi so much money so, he, um, so they can take him into the hospital. But once we got to that hospital, um, there was, it was one of the biggest hospital in um, Congo. It's called Seashu. And that I, like, I, I remember just getting inside that hospital. There were so many people on the side because there was not enough beds. So every, you can just see like, people in pain, you know, like a lot of people had some cut on the, like it was just, I think for me it was from there that I decided I would never be a doctor because I did not want to have people life to rely on me. Um, but I remember the second I saw my mom, uh, sorry. But from being in that hospital, uh, we, they told my family that they couldn't take me because there was not enough room and I needed to be seen by a doctor and there was not enough doctors either. At that moment, I knew I had to stay strong for my mom even though I was the one in pain. When it was the last time that you felt like you were in pain but you felt like I have to, you have to numb the pain just because you don't wanna think about it or you wanna feel, make people around you feel better. But that pain couldn't go away because it was, it, was, it was pretty obvious. It was really, really, really bad. But I remember we, um, they told us, well, there was an, there's another hospital next by that we could go if we wanted to get treatment. But that hospital was a private hospital. So it was a lot of money that we had to pay and we could not afford for that. But we still went. We had hope that um, probably, I don't know, something's gonna happen, they will see us. As soon as we went to that hospital, um, my mom looked very put together. She looked like she had money. So they didn't even ask, ask any question. They just say, okay, we got her. You can just come and pay at the end. I mean, that's why you don't judge a book by its cover because I know we cannot pay for that, you know? <laughs> but because of how she presented herself, they were able to let us in and it was very, very expensive for us to be there. So um, we reached to the private hospital. Um, I stayed there for about five days. But being in that hospital just made me think about how God's goodness is. Just, I was just in the hospital next to it and I, I don't know if I was even gonna make it and just going to that hospital not having the money. But here I am being treated like a, like I was being treated like a queen, you know? Um, but I remember being in that hospital, my, one of my uncle that was in the hospital next to the one I came from, the public, um, the public hospital. He, he was in there a while before I came, but I remember like December 31st, he came to, um, he was in, I don't know if he had cancer, I'm not sure, but he was in that hospital and he came to visit me. And I remember when he came to visit me, um, he, he say some great things about, the kind of person I'm going to be when I grow up. And I just remember him saying things. I don't really remember the whole situation because I was in bed for a while. I couldn't really do anything on my own. I had to just sit there and even, uh, I couldn't even eat on my own. Um, but I remember what he said, you know, he told me that I was gonna be, I was gonna do great things in life. And, and then here is where the story is going. Um, So my mom would pray every night and I could hear her. So I was so scared that I was going to die because I was like, why is all these prayers? Cause I'm not trying to die right now. Um, but my mom's strength gave me more hope that I was going to make it. I started praying every night too. So whenever my family would leave the hospital, I would cry out to God, I don't want to die, God. I'm so young and I want, I want to make my mom proud. But I, I, if you remember the story I told when my uncle came and then when my uncle left, the next day I was out of the hospital, I think it was January 1st. It was an exciting moment, right? To go back and be with friends. But all, all I can remember is me getting out of that hospital and going to my uncle's funeral. You know, at that time I was only, what, like eight years old?
I didn't really, um, I didn't understand the situation. How come, I asked God, like, how come certain people make it to life, you know? What happened to those people that were in bed in the hospital? How come they didn't make it? How come I was the one that got the chance to be treated? When, how come, I asked myself so many times, well, is, God, is my uncle purpose just to come to the hospital and then die? Like, what's God's goodness if all this thing, like me coming out, I'm supposed to be happy not to go to a funeral, you know? And, you know, if, if uh, I don't know, I didn't share this, but my family, if you heard about the genocide of Rwanda that happened um, about 26 years ago, my family have already lost enough family. And, and I remember asking God, like, is it, isn't it the genocide enough? Enough people have already gone for my family. Like, why I don't, and something else that will put so much um, pain into our family. But now I can really say that I don't know the answer to why certain people die early, why certain people don't make it, why certain people don't have the same thing that we have. But I, all, I, all I know is that's the beauty of trusting God, right? Just trusting that in anything he does, he doesn't do it to arm us, but he does it to love us, even when death is involved. But I remember when I told, I told God that if he let me out of this hospital, I would serve him forever. I told him if, if I don't, I told God that like, yes, I may be young, I have some, so much to offer. So I told God that if he let me out of this hospital, I will be the person that he wants me to be. And I remember going to the um, funeral. I still didn't know what was going on. I didn't know that that would be the last time I would see my uncle, you know. But as soon as the funeral was done, uh, I think the next Sunday, I went to church. I was, uh, um, we used to go to a Catholic church. And then the pastor was talking about, uh, our priest was talking about getting baptized. So in Catholic church, you have to like go to a whole um, class section where it's like a three month before you get baptized and you have to pay a fee. And, and I remember as soon as he said that, I did not have any money with me. I told the, uh, the person that we had to sign up with uh, to give the money to sign up for the class to get baptized. I told him, I don't have money right now, but I'm going to go home. Would you wait for me? I want to sign up for it. I want to do it today. And he was like, don't, there will be more times. There's always going to be opportunity. I was like, no, I want to do it today. Can you wait for me? And my mom lived... We live 25 minutes away from the church. I, I remember my, I was running. Right now, if you tell me to park up there, I would not even park there. I want to park so close to the church so I don't have to work. <laughs> but I remember I ran so far just to go. Get, I still remember exactly what I was wearing that day. I went and knocked on my door. And my mom's door I was like, I need money. She goes for a while. I was like, I need to get baptized. And, and it was a choice that I made. You know, no one told me you need to go get baptized. Um, I felt like that was part of me just showing God that I want to serve him, you know. Um, my mom gave me the money, and I went, um, and I took the class. And from that day that I got baptized, marked the day I started my journey with God. So if you can go back to the question that I told you earlier, what does it mean to accept Jesus as your personal savior? Well, have you accepted Christ as your personal savior? I guess to properly understand this question, you have to understand the term Jesus and personal savior. Oftentimes we just tell people, yeah, you should accept Jesus as a personal savior, but we don't even know the difference sometimes. You know, we don't want to assume that everybody knows what it means. We have... We only have our understanding of Jesus Christ. The Bible defined Jesus Christ as God in the flesh, God in human form. You can find that verse in John 1, 1 to 14. God came on earth to teach us. He came here to heal us, to correct us, to forgive us. And he died for us. Jesus Christ is God, the creator the sovereign Lord, have you accepted this Jesus? Well, what is a savior? What do we even need a savior? 
I mean, we can just live our life like this without a Savior, but why do we need that? The Bible tells us that we have all sinned. We have all committed evil acts. As a result of our sin, we deserve God's anger and God's judgment. But the only just punishment for sins committed against an infinite and eternal God is an infinite punishment. And that is why we need a savior. Jesus Christ came on earth. He died in our place. Jesus died. Jesus' death was an infinite payment for our sins. Do you believe that? And Jesus died to pay the penalty of our sin. I don't know anybody else who will die to pay the penalty of your sin. If you know, that's great. I don't know anybody else but God. He paid the price that, so that we will not have to. He paid the price so none of us have to, to worry about all those things. His resurrection from the death was to prove that his death was enough to pay the penalty of our sins. And that is why Jesus is the one and only Savior. So are you trusting in Jesus as your Savior? Is Jesus your personal Savior? You know, many people view Christianity as attending churches or not committing certain sins. I mean, I'm not a pastor to say this, but I don't think that's, I personally don't think that's Christianity. I believe that Christianity is having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So when you accept Jesus Christ as a personal Savior, it means that you're placing your own personal faith and trust in him. No one is saved by the faith of others. It doesn't mean that my mom is a Christian. That means I'm a Christian too. If I don't have that relationship with him myself, then it doesn't work like that. No one is forgiven by doing certain deeds. You pay for someone to go to school, but you don't have that relationship with God. Well, this, that's something that you need to think about, right? And the only way to be saved is to personally accept Jesus as your Savior. Trusting in his death as a payment for your sin and his, and his resurrection as your guarantee to eternal life. And again, is Jesus your personal Savior? As we're doing baptized today, if you feel like this is something that you've been having in your mind... If this is something that you thought about but you're not sure, let me just remind you that sometimes when you want to surrender things to God and let God be in control, it's just making that first step. You don't have to wait too long. Maybe this is the moment. Maybe this is the time. You don't want to go home and regret, oh, my gosh, I wish I was there on that stage and get baptized. But that doesn't mean I think something that makes us afraid to get baptized is like, well, I don't. I don't want to get baptized and then the next day I commit sin again. Well, no. I think, I think part of it will, will, nobody is perfect, right? You being baptized is just making your journey with God more consistent too. So you standing there today doesn't mean, no, as I leave this place, I'm going to be a Christian, a perfect Christian forever. No one is perfect. We all make mistakes every day. But when you get baptized, you're reminded of the love of God and how much you need to do to, help, to be it. So if you want to accept Jesus today as your personal Savior, I would like to invite you when we're, people are getting baptized and talk to someone, even if you don't feel brave enough to do this today. I mean, we have extra clothes, you know. And we can give it to you. But like I say, do not wait. This is the moment. If this is the time that you're supposed to do this, you should go for it. Because at that age, when I was eight years old, I didn't know the whole meaning of getting baptized. But I just knew that I had to do it. It was my time to do that. And it didn't matter how far my house was. I was going to get that money and come back and get baptized. 
And I won't say that after I get baptized, my life got better, you know. I was still an immigrant, a refugee from a different country. Things were still going the way it goes, but I knew that I had God, that I have accepted Jesus. And all those questions that I asked myself, that is Jesus real? Is, uh, it, why do we have to suffer all this thing? I just let God be in control because I know all these questions that you're trying to, we're trying to find, like you can't really find them, but unless you just trust him. That's why we have faith, why? To just believe without seeing. But I have this prayer that I want us to all say as the worship team comes up. Um, this, this prayer, I just want to tell you that this prayer will not save you. But only believing in Jesus Christ and his finished walk on the cross for you can save you from sin. Let me start it again one more time. This prayer that we're going to say will not save you. But only believing in Jesus Christ and his finished walk on the cross for you can only save you from sin. So if we can all stand, if everybody can just stand. I want you guys to say this prayer like you mean it. And if you, I know sometimes like we, when you're saying something, you don't want to say because you don't, you don't want to commit to it. It's okay, just say it, just let it be. God is not going to judge you for saying his, his word and then do the opposite. Are you guys ready for this? Okay. So it goes like that. I'm going to say it and then you guys repeat after me. God, I know I have sinned against you. And deserve punishment. But I know you took the punishment that I deserve so I could be forgiven. I receive your offer of forgiveness and place my trust in you for salvation. But I say this part louder. I accept Jesus as my personal savior. And thank you for loving me eternally. Amen. Amen. Thank you. As we get ready for a baptism, you guys can have your seats and as we continue this morning. so premature, uh, Russell, that, but that's one of my favorite, favorite songs. How about we let M.A. know just again how much we appreciated what she had to share. So I just, I just walked in here from a, a class that we've been working through where we talked about our stories and how you know, God's work, at least in part, is helping us to understand how our stories can be woven into his story. Did you get that this morning? And so the, the idea that she shared at the end in such a, a clearly put understanding of, of knowing Christ 
and drawing that into her own personal story, her own journey, his desire is that that would be the case with all of us. He longs to have us be uh, a part of his story, working through uh, the trauma, the challenge, the, the celebrative moments, the crying out moments of our lives and letting them become part of his story to a world that needs for our story to be told because it's a reflection of his redemption and his story. Amen? And she came down so beautifully to this very uh, succinct idea. And it made me think of a song that some of you are very familiar with. Um, I don't know. It's been a long time since I've heard this song even sung. But, but the line goes like this. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. And so we make a decision at that point when that realization comes to us that that is where we're at, too. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. He did it for me. And so the two people that I have here today, they have different stories. Um, I would say this to you. There is a box, before I go any further, right there. I'm looking at it. It has two towels and two complete sets of clothing. T-shirts and, uh, and shorts. So if there is someone here who that realization of, uh, of what Ame had to say this morning is your realization too, and as you're seated here, you're saying to yourself, I need to make that choice. I need to make that decision. The prayer that she walked us through is, is exactly the statement that needs to be made, the, the acknowledgement that needs to take place uh, for all of us. But I would also say, you know, I say this to, at some point in a wedding every time, there, there's a phrase that I usually get to, and it says something like this, your, your marriage will not be made by these words that you say to each other. It's your commitment to the concepts that are a part of these things you say. Yeah. And so it's not the, it's not the speaking of that is any more than it's the, the water in here that makes you, as she said, perfect. That comes in the journey. Amen? And so, and it's not the speaking of, I, I you know, this thing that I repeated what Amay said, though it is, it's helpful. We all use those, those ideas to communicate this, is, but owning it, as she said, I needed to do that. I chose Jesus and understood I needed a Savior. And so if that fits you today, as she said, you don't have to go away from this place and not be baptized because we have a box with stuff so you can take care of that today. And, and there was a service not that long ago. I'm old, I can say that. That can refer to things decades ago, you know. But where we had, I think, at least five or six people who got up right where they were and joined in this. That's not a marketing uh, message. That's a statement that says, you have X amount of moments in your life where God's Spirit will speak to you and you will know it. And then it'll be your choice to respond to His Spirit. And things that we ignore that come under that heading... Uh, they kind of slide into the rearview mirror of our life and we move on. But when we act in faith upon a truth that God has given us, His Spirit begins to work in a fresh way in our lives. And so the action is significant. Mm -hmm. So I'll come back to that in a few minutes, but right now uh, we have a young lady. Uh, her name is Beatrice. <laughs> And I would say, too, um, when, we, when we complete the, the sacrament, the, the process, the action step of this, it is very much, if you haven't been here before, but it's very much our tradition that there is much rejoicing. <laughs> so.
Got it? Yeah. Okay. Are you going to keep your glasses on or take them off? Yeah, I have to. Okay, okay. <laughs> so there's a couple of questions that we have uh, discussed uh, prior to this moment. And, uh, and so Beatrice is, uh, is completely aware. Let me make sure I'm saying. Um, so the first question is this, can you introduce yourself to these people and, and just, uh, yeah, just introduce yourself. Give us your full name. Good morning. My name is Beatrice Toure. <laughs> <laughs> so in the second question is a, is a simple yes or no question. Uh, and, and as I've said, MA has already kind of led us right into that. She, she uh, put this in front of us in several occasions, but I'm going to speak directly to you on this and say, have you accepted Christ as your Savior and as the Lord of your life, realizing that his work on the cross, his shedding of his blood, was the price paid for your sin? Affirm yes. <laughs> <laughs> I notice you have some uh, paperwork with you, so... Um, the next question is, is can you kind of describe kind of the process, the how, when, where uh, of all that? And, and if that paperwork helps you, go ahead and unfold it. I had to write it down because I tend to overshare. So. <laughs> <laughs> the Bible says in Proverbs 3, chapter, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 to 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Straightforward, right? I did the complete opposite. Always, um, right. always acted on my own decisions. Um, and I always have to withstand the consequences every time. It came to a point, it got exhausting. I started doubting myself in everything I do. I didn't trust myself anymore. My ways never worked, and I always feel stuck. I'd get angry and frustrated every time. I'd hold grudges. I was hard, it, was, it was hard to maintain friendships, and I somehow managed to ruin some amazing bonds that I've built over the years. So I started coming back closer to God through the Vibe Fellowship. Um, it was never the same after that one night. I remember I was reading the Lord's Prayer as, as I was closing my prayers, because I read the Lord's Prayer at the end of every, every time I pray. <laughs> And then the, these words, forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. I kid you not, I felt so calm and relief as I spoke these words. I started smiling. I felt so happy within myself for the first time in a long time. I could feel myself letting go and allowing him nudge me. <laughs> I could feel myself letting go and allowing him nudge me in the right direction. Or better still, take the will. I wouldn't say I'm where I want to be in life right now, but I can probably say I'm not where I used to be. Yes. And to answer your question, Pastor, this decision was made wholeheartedly, and yeah, that's it. <laughs> so lastly, are there some people that you would like to acknowledge um, here today who have been uh, helpful? <laughs> I thought that might be the case. I was going to tell you to hold off on folding that up, but are there some people that you'd like to acknowledge, either here today or, or even folks who have gone on to heaven already, but they were instrumental in encouraging you in this decision? 
Yes, um, I'd like to first of all thank God for allowing me to see this day, and I would like to thank the church for welcoming me in this community. Um, I've been around since I was in high school, and um, I am thankful for the life of Amy for being an inspiration to me. Um, I also want to thank uh, Miss Ida May for starting the high school Bible study. <laughs> that, was, that was my first point of contact. Um, in the beginning, it was just a hangout spot, but it came in really handy. <laughs> and um, I would also like to thank my parents and every member of my household for not giving up on me when I wasn't at my best. Um, I'd also like to thank the, the Vibe for amazing talents and spirit moving worship nights. Don't stop, um, it's, it's doing great and it's inspiring people. You don't even know it, they're inspiring. So if you have a time, just stop by, you will never be the same. Um, I'd like to mention a life of um, Kofi who always been there for me and he never left my side and he always been a friend to me. I also want to uh, thank Ms. Barbara for always being the gentle soul that she is and loving us and welcoming us in her home and giving us peace of advices um, when needed. And lastly, I want to thank myself <laughs> for wanting better and doing better. <laughs> Beatrice Touré, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are so proud of you. We are so proud of you. Right, sir, why don't you uh, give us uh, your full name? Um, just introduce yourself to the group here today. My name is Christopher John Pletnick. <laughs> so have you asked Christ to come into your heart, um, recognizing him as your Lord and Savior, and that the work he did on the cross was the price paid for your sin? Absolutely, yes, with all my heart. So I, I wanted to just kind of put a pause button before we go to the, to the next question here a second. Because, um, so, so this is, so how many times have you attended worship here? This is my second time. So... And the first, the actually you kind of you 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 were in attendance one other time, but it was like three weeks ago, correct? Mm -hmm. And and it was uh, it was online, yeah. Yes. So that, if you recall, was the last time that we did a baptism service. And um, so you watched that service. Then what did you do? I came straight to the church. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It was. Um, a blessing that they were baptizing while I turned turned on the 
the live stream because that's exactly what I was looking for and that's that's exactly what I wanted to do so well and you said something so um, so Chris so I was sitting down here I think and the service was over for the rest of you and um, and then I noticed a, a young man sitting where Kathy is right behind Sharon there I think is where you were at and and I knew I didn't know who you were, and so I moved over and, and sat down, I think, up there, and, and you came and, uh, and told me what you just said. And you also said something that I thought was interesting, if, just really quickly, that you had been past the church several times and felt like uh, God was talking to you. Is that right? For about three years. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so some things have to cook a while. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so then, so then the first step though was the online service. You just decided, and then you folks have heard. So, you know, I think that that can be a really great encouragement for us to continue to pray and understand how significant that kind of connectivity is to our church. And uh, and as I'm looking at the the camera, I'm not sure which one or ones are looking at me right now, but just saying to you, there's still time. Um, if you get in your car right now, <laughs> not kidding. So, uh, do you want to share, you know, I know I, I would just, I don't want to put you in a spot here, but it was a pretty emotional. I could tell that God was really working and had been for a while on things. Obviously I didn't understand, but, uh, you know, you came to this place and you even gave me a date while we were sitting there. Um, so can you share with us today a little bit about the, the process and, and that brings you to this place today? Absolutely. Uh, today I'm a wretch reborn. I spent uh, from the age of 13 to 34 strung out completely. Every drug you can think of. Um, I lived downtown Seattle for about eight years. And I didn't even keep a tent. I slept on the street all the time. Um, completely strung out on all the drugs. I spent a lot of time in jail. I've been to prison. Um, I saw a lot of things out there. I saw a lot of uh, young people die. Uh, very sad. And today I'm reborn because I, I started to... Uh, instead of being upset with God, although I, I never, I've always kept Jesus Christ relevant in my life. Uh, for a long time, I blamed him and I cursed him and I, you know, for my situation, for my family not speaking to me anymore. I haven't seen my daughter. I'm a terrible father. I haven't seen her and I left when she, when she was four. She's going to be 15. Um, so, I'm kind of losing my place here. Um, so I lived uh, a long time in, um, again, always keeping Jesus relevant, but blaming him and being angry at him for my life and my situation. Um, after the, the, the drugs and the heroin, I, I was on methadone and suboxone. If anybody knows what that is, it's, it's methadone maintenance for people who are addicted to opiates. I was on that for five or six years, and I thought I was doing good, but I was a zombie. I had no real thought. I had no cl real clarity. I couldn't see God. I couldn't hear God while I was on that stuff. So January 3rd, 2022, I, uh, I stopped it completely. And to stop that kind of medicine is a very painful process. Not a lot of people can do it. It's, com it's extremely physically difficult and painful. But God delivered me that day. He, he, he absolutely delivered me. He changed my heart 100% today. I don't participate in any type of drugs or alcohol whatsoever. Nothing. Nothing. And uh, it, I, I'm 39 years old, and it took a long time in my life to, to get to this point. And I, I couldn't feel I, I didn't know life could feel so good being sober. It's amazing. It's amazing. And... Um, I, I know that God delivered me and I know he changed my heart. And, and when I stopped cursing and blaming him for the bus passing me by or whatever it might be, 
I started walking in his ways and actually following the commandments and doing everything in my heart that I could do to, to walk in his path. And it was like a strike of lightning hit me and I just completely changed. Uh, my heart 100% is full. My anxieties are gone. My depression is gone. I have a lot to be upset about in life, but I'm not. I, I, I'm not. <laughs> So are there some folks that you would like to acknowledge and just say, you know, even when these people uh, pointed me toward Jesus, these people stuck with me, encouraged me um, all the way back to whenever? Absolutely. Um, I have a childhood friend. His name is Justin Unger. Some of you might know him. He's a very accomplished Christian artist, and he runs his own church in Arizona. Uh, I grew up with this, with this guy, and... Um, we were best of friends. He stayed on the path and I went left. Um, but he was a big inspiration for my life uh, just to keep Jesus again relevant, even though I wasn't paying attention to him so much and cursing him, stuff like that. It was a big part. Uh, Jesus has always been in my life. I've just, I can't remember a time when I haven't considered God and Jesus Christ relevant. Uh, just, just times when I've been mad at him and angry for my situation. Um, another one was Elizabeth Richardson, another childhood friend who, thank God, these people were around me because I think he knew I was going to stray um, eventually. But she, her and her family would take me to church every Wednesday to a Baptist church and we'd do the crafts and the Bible study and everything else. And it was like, it's the best memories I have in my life. Was, I, I, I wish I could reconnect with them somehow someday because uh, beautiful, beautiful people, beautiful family. Um, my mother always held religion, although she uh, was weak. Uh, again, I'm sure she always kept Jesus Christ relevant, but she's, I, don't, I never experienced her do anything like this, you know, and, and so openly and outwardly. But I, I do give her credit for always, always, um, she used to say, but there for the God, grace of God go you all the time. And th that was another thing that kept, kept Jesus in my mind. Um, my grandmother, I eat a cat's, rest her soul. Again, I, I just blessed to have religious people in my family and in my life. My stepfather was a, a nuclear scientist, a nuclear engineer and a scientist, so he uh, often discouraged the, uh, the praise and the, the outward speaking of God with my mother, kind of kept her down in that regard. So I pray they're doing well today. I, I really have no idea. I haven't spoken to them in a very long time. Um, Anyone else? And my other grandmother, uh, Margaret O'Field. Again, very, very religious. And my grandfather, oh, I can't believe I almost forgot him, Delbert Oldfield, postmaster, World War II veteran, um, sang in the choir at church. I love this man so much, and I, I, I pray to him, and I, I try to talk to him when I when I pray and talk to myself, you know, he, he was a wonderful man, a wonderful man. And uh, again, just another um, support and a backbone for Jesus Christ and for the church and for the faith in my life that uh, has absolutely solidified where I am today because of everything I've gone to, gone through. I certainly have had a lot of chances to, to run astray. So... This is a big step for me. I'm glad I'm finally doing it, and uh, I'm happy to be here. Amen. Kneel down. And then if you want to cover your nose, you can go ahead. I'm glad you didn't forget Delbert. Me too. Uh, <laughs> All right. Chris Pletnick, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
So we have pancakes that are ready in just a few moments, and so I, I, I don't want to make too uh, or say too much here, but um, I would be remiss if I didn't give, I think, anybody else who wants to come forward. As I said, the clothes, the uh, towels are here. If there's anyone else. Kathy, I wasn't sure if you had something to say. <laughs> Anyone else? The water is nice and warm. So one of the things I very strongly believe uh, about baptism, and I've said it a couple times, but it's a connectivity point too. And we use that word a lot, I guess in part because we've come out of this time where there's been so much isolation. And so we, uh, we specifically felt like this was going to be a time as we're coming back together with, uh, with meeting in person and, and some of the things that have separated us, uh, that we wanted to do some things that were family directed. And so we did a membership class and we did the, the opportunity too for baptism. If today you are feeling like you, you at least want to research what M.A. said today, or even the dialogue that we had here in the water today about baptism, you're just not quite completely sure, then, then please talk to uh, myself, uh, uh, Pastor Russell, one of the people, uh, Grantley over here, Denise, Gary, talk to anybody who you think might know more about this thing than you do and ask for them to give you some direction. It could, it could be a moment where, as, as Chris shared, you quit going left, left, <laughs> and find your way back to the path that God had in mind for you. Um, so please think about that and, and pray for that. Uh, I wanted to say just a, a couple quick things too. Uh, we have prayed not necessarily specifically for the church uh, and for the country and the people of Ukraine. Uh, the church has been t receiving in our giving uh, electronically and in other ways. Um, we've already committed several thousand dollars from this congregation, but what's, what's even cooler in this connectivity part is, is as we've linked arms with several other churches within our denomination, our denomination is approaching a million dollars that has been given. So keep thinking and praying about that. Another point of connectivity I wanted to mention is... Uh, you know, we hosted the memorial service here for Jadida Weru. Uh, she is now, uh, her body is, is in Kenya. And the service um, that they'll be having there for her family and the, the Kenyan community in Kenya will be this Tuesday, this coming Tuesday. Steve and Margaret are there to be, uh, to participate in that. And, uh, and some of what you gave also helped for her to be able to uh, for the Kenyan community here to be able to bring her body back home. And that's a community celebration too. So I thank you for that. We are having pancakes, like I said. Um, so, so stick around a little bit. Uh, continue to knit together some of the community things. You know, um, when we did the pass out the paper roses last week, and mine was the best, but as we did that... Um, we had some awkward conversation, uh, and, and that is okay. That's what a family does. And so as we go and we eat pancakes, seek somebody out, begin a relationship, or take the next step in a conversation with someone a generation apart or a culture apart, so that you begin to, you know, or continue to knit community together. If you'll do that for me, say amen. Amen. Russell, let's, let's finish with song here. Thank you.
Blessings, everybody. <laughs> God bless the pancakes in Jesus' name. Yeah. <laughs>